Hi and welcome to another video from James Dobb Stories. If you're enjoying the content on my channel, then check out my Patreon page for amazing audiobooks, including Harry Potter, David Walliams, The Hunger Games, and much, much more. You're welcome and thank you. Now, let's get into today's video. Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson. One girl. The first day back at school, I'm walking because I missed the bus. Not a good start. Year nine. I wonder what it'll be like. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. It's on that classic Beatles White album, the crazy mixed up bit at the end. I've always felt close to John Lennon, even though he died before I was born. I like him because he did all those crazy little drawings and he wore granny glasses. He was funny and he always just did his own thing. I do crazy little drawings and I wear granny glasses and my friends think I'm funny. I don't get the opportunity to do my own thing though. It's half past eight. If I was doing my own thing right now, I'd be back in bed, curled up, fast asleep. John Lennon had lions, didn't he? When he and Yoko stayed in bed all day. They even gave interviews to journalists in bed. Cool. So, if I could do my own thing, I'd sleep till midday. Then breakfast. Hot chocolate and donuts. I'd listen to music and fool around in my sketchbook. Maybe watch a video. Then I'll eat again. I'll send out for pizza. Though maybe I should stick to salads. I guess it would be easy to put on a weight, lying around in bed all day. I don't want to end up looking like a beached whale. I'll have a green salad and green grapes. And what's a green drink? There's that liqueur uh, I sipped around at Magda's, creme de menthe. I can't say I was that thrilled. It was a bit like drinking toothpaste. Forget the drink. I'll phone Magda, though, and Nadine, and we'll have a long natter. And then, well, it'll be the evening now, so I'll have a bath and wash my hair and change into... What should I wear in bed? Not my own teddy bear nighty. Much too babyish but I don't fancy one of those slinky satin numbers. I know, I'll wear a long white gown with embroidered roses, all colours of the rainbow, and I'll put a big flash ring on every finger and lie flat on my bed like Frida Kahlo. She's another one of my heroes, this amazing South American artist with extraordinary eyebrows and earrings and flowers in her hair. Okay, there I am, back in bed and looking beautiful. Then I hear the door opening, footsteps. It's my boyfriend coming to see me. The only trouble is, I haven't got a boyfriend. Well, I haven't got a Frida Kahlo outfit, or a bedside phone, or my own television and video, and my bed sags because my little brother, Eggs, uses it as a trampoline whenever I'm not around. I could put up with all these deprivations. I'd just like a boyfriend, please. Just as I'm thinking this, a beautiful blonde boy with big brown eyes comes sauntering around a car parked partly on the pavement. He steps to one side to get out of my way. Only, I've stepped the same way. He steps to the other side, and so do I. We look like we're doing a crazy kind of two-step. Oh, uh, whoops, uh, sorry, I stammer. I feel my face flooding scarlet. He stays cool, one eyebrow slightly raised. He doesn't say anything, but he smiles at me. He smiles at me. Then he walks neatly past while I divver, still in a daze. I look back over my shoulder. He's looking back at me. He really is. Maybe. Maybe he likes me. No, that's mad. Why should this really incredible guy, who must be at least 18, think anything of a stupid schoolgirl who can't even walk past him properly? He's not looking up. He's looking down. He's looking at my legs. Oh God, maybe my skirt really is too short. I turned it up myself last night. Anna said she'd shorten it for me, but I knew she'd only turn it, into a turn it up a centimetre or so. I wanted my skirt really short. Only, I'm not that great at sewing. The hem went a bit bunchy. When I tried the skirt back on, there suddenly seemed a very large amount of chubby pink leg on show. Anna didn't say anything, but I, I knew what she was thinking. Dad was more direct. For God's sake, Ellie, that skirt barely covers your knickers. Honestly, I said, sighing, I thought you tried to be hip, Dad. Everyone wears their skirts this length. It's true, Magna's skirt is even shorter, but her legs are long and lightly tanned. She's always moaning about her legs, saying she hates the way the muscle sticks out at the back. She used to do ballet and tap, and she still does jazz dancing. She moans, but she doesn't mean it. She shows her legs off every chance she gets. Nadine's skirts are short too. Her legs are never brown. They're either black when she's wearing her opaque tights or white when she has to go to school. Nadine can't stand getting suntanned. She's a very gothic girl with a vampire complexion. She's very willowy as well as white. Short skirts look so much better with slender legs. It's depressing when your two best friends in all the world are much thinner than you are. It's even more depressing when your stepmother is thinner too, with positively model girl looks. Anna is only 27 and she looks younger. When we go out together, people think we're sisters, only we don't look a bit alike. She's so skinny and striking. I'm little and lumpy. I'm not exactly fat, not really. It doesn't help having such a round face. Well, I'm round all over. 
My tummy's round and my bum is round. Even my stupid knees are round. Still, my chest is round too. Magda has to resort to a wonder bra to get a proper cleavage, and the dean is utterly flat. I don't mind my top. I just wish there was much less of my bottom. Oh God, what must I look like from the back view? No wonder he's staring. I scuttle round the corner, feeling such a fool. My legs have gone so wobbly it's hard to walk. They look as if they're blushing too. Look at them, pink as hams. Who am I kidding? Of course I'm fat. The waistband on my indecently short skirt is uncomfortably tight. I've got fatter this summer. I just know I have. Especially these last three terrible weeks at the cottage. It's so unfair. Everyone else goes off on these really glamorous jaunts abroad. Magna went to Spain. Nadine went to America. I went to our damp, dreary cottage in Wales. And it rained and it rained and it rained. I got so bored sitting around playing infantile games of snap and old maid with eggs and watching fuzzy telly on the black and white portable and tramping through a sea of mud in my wellies that I just ate all the time. Three meals a day and at least 33 snacks. Mars bars and jelly beans and popcorn and tortilla chips and salt and vinegar crisps and magnum ice creams. Gobble, gobble, gobble. It's no wonder that I wobble. Yuck, my knees are actually wobbling as I walk. I hate walking. I don't see the point of going for a walk, lumbering along in this great big loop, just to get back to where you've come from. We always do so much walking in Wales. Dad and Anna always stride ahead. Little eggs le leaps about like a loony. I slouch behind them and mud sucking at my wellies. And I think to myself, this is fun. Why have a holiday cottage in Wales of all places? Why can't we have a holiday villa in Spain or a holiday apartment in New York? Magda and Nadine are so lucky. Okay, Magda was on a package tour and they stayed in a high-rise hotel and Nadine was only in Orlando doing a, di doing a Disney. But I bet they both have brilliant sunshine every day. In our little bit of Wales, it's always the rainy season. Black clouds are a permanent fixture, like the mountains. It even rains inside the cottage because Dad thinks he can fix the roof slates himself and he always makes a total botch of it. We have buckets and bowls and saucepans scattered all over upstairs and day and night there's this drip, tinkle, splosh symphony. I got so utterly fed up and depressed that when we paid the usual visit to this boring old ruined castle, I felt like casting myself off the battlements. I leaned against the stone wall at the top, my heart still banging away like crazy from the awful climb, and wondered what it would be like to leap over into thin air. Would anyone seriously care if I ended up going splat onto the cobblestones below? Dad and Anna had a firm grip on eggs, but they didn't make a grab at me, even when I leaned right over, my head dangling. They actually wandered off hand in hand with him, mumbling about Baileys and boiling oil. They are overdoing the involved parent act. I doubt if Eggs can spell castle yet, so he's certainly not at the serious project stage. Dad never did all this stuff with me when I was little. He always seemed to be working or busy. When we went on holiday, he went off sketching, but I didn't care. I had mum. Then, thinking about mum made me feel worse. People don't expect me to remember her still. They're mad. I can remember so much about her. Heaps and heaps of stuff. The games we used to play with my Barbie dolls and the songs we'd sing, how she let me put on her makeup and try on her, all her jewellery and her pink silk petticoat and her high heels. I want to talk about her so much, but whenever I try with Dad, he goes all tense and quiet. He frowns as if he has a headache. He doesn't want to remember Mum. Well, he's got Anna now and they've both got eggs. I haven't got anyone. I started to feel so miserably I mooched off, mooched, mooched off my, by myself. I walked to the other side of the battlements and found a crumbling turret. The entrance was roped off, with a warning. I ducked under the rope and climbed up all those dank steps in the dark. Then I put my foot on a step that wasn't there and tripped, banging my shin. It wasn't really that painful, but I found I was crying. You can't really climb when you're crying, so I sat down and sobbed. After a while, I realised I didn't have a tissue. My glasses were all wet and my nose was running. I wiped and sniffed as best I could. The stone steps were very cold and the damp spread through my jeans, but I still sat there. I suppose I was waiting for Dad to come looking for me. I waited and I waited and I waited and then I heard footsteps. I sat still, listening. Quick, light footsteps. Too light for Dad. Too quick for me to get out of the way in time. Someone tripped right over me and we both screamed. Ouch! Ouch! I'm sorry. I didn't have a clue anyone was sitting there. You're kneeling on me. Sorry, sorry. Here, let me help you up. Careful. He was hauling so vigorously we both nearly toppled downwards. Whoops! Watch out! I struggled free and stood with my back against the damp wall. He stood up too. It was too dark to make out more than a vague shape. What were you doing sitting in the dark? You haven't hurt yourself, have you? I wasn't hurt. I might be now. I still feel very squashed. Sorry, I keep saying that, don't I? Thought it, well, though it was a bit crackers to crouch like that in the dark. Next time you might get a whole troop of boy scouts hiking over you. 
or a coachload of American tourists trumpling you with their trainers or, or I'm burbling. It's difficult making conversation when you can't see. Let's go on up to see if it gets lighter. I don't think you can. The steps seem to give out. Oh well, that figures. Let's go back down then. I hesitated, giving a quick wipe of my face with the back of my hand. There wasn't much point sitting there any longer. Dad and Anna and Eggs had probably forgotten all about me. Gone right back to the cottage. They'd suddenly snap their fingers three days later. What's happened to Ellie, they'd say, and shrug and forget about me again. The boy seemed to think I was timid. I'll hold your hand if you like, to help you down. I can manage perfectly, thanks, I said. Though it was a bit hairy feeling our way down, the steps seemed more slippery and there wasn't any handrail. I stumbled once and he grabbed me. Careful. I'm being careful, I said. I bet you there's an attendant waiting for us at the bottom to nag us rotten about the danger, he said. That's the trouble, though. The minute I see something roped off, I have this desperate urge to explore inside. So consequently, I'm forever in a fix. Dopey Dan. That's what my family and friends call me when they're narked. I'm Daniel, but I'm only called that when they're really, really, really going ballistic. It's plain Dan most of the time. He went on like this until we emerged, blinking into the daylight. Plain Dan was perfect. He had wild, exploding hair and a silly little snub nose that he twitched to hitch his glasses into place. I blinked through my own smeary specks and focused properly. It's you, we said spontaneously. His family had another equally damp and dilapidated holiday cottage about half a mile down the valley from ours. We saw them in the village spa, buying their groceries, and they were often in the pub in the evenings too. My dad and his dad sometimes played darts together. Anna and Dan's mum sat and made strained conversation. They looked like they came from different planets, even though they were both in jeans and jerseys and boots. Anna's jeans show off her tiny, tight bum, and her jersey is an artwork designer sweater, and her boots have got buckles and pointy toes. Dan's mum has a bum much bigger than mine. Her jumpers were all too tight, too, and one of them was actually unravelling. Her boots were serious walking boots, caked with mud. The whole family were serious walkers, whatever the weather. We'd see them setting out in a downpour in their orange cagoules, and hours later we'd spot those mobile marigolds at the top of a dim, distant mountain. There were five children, all earnest and old-fashioned. Dan was the eldest, about my age, a good inch shorter than me, even though I'm little. He had a fat guidebook about castles sticking out of his cagoul. Typical. We made it, he said, as if we'd just returned from outer space. He tried to jump the rope in triumph, but tripped. No wonder they call you Dopey Dan, I mumbled, as I skirted the rope. There was still no sign of Dad and Anna and Eggs. Maybe they really had gone off without me. What's your name? Dan asked, brushing himself down. Rapunzel? What? Well, I found you languishing in a tower, didn't I? I had sudden memories of a little ladybird fairy tale book. Are you into fairy tales, I said. I intended it as an insult, but he took me seriously. I don't mind them, actually. Some. My dad gave me a copy of the uh, Mambinogian, seeing as we're in Wales. He could well have been speaking Welsh for all the sense he was making. It's old Welsh fairy stuff, dead romantic in parts. I'd lend you the book if you like. I don't think it sounds my sort of thing. So what is your sort of thing, then? What, what do you like reading? What's that little black book you've always got with you? I was surprised. He must have been watching me carefully. I usually kept my book hidden in my jacket pocket. That's just my little sketchbook. Let's have a look then, he said, patting my pocket. No, go on, don't be shy. I'm not the slightest bit shy, it's private. What sort of thing do you sketch? Castles? Not castles. Mountains? Not mountains either. Then what? God, you aren't half nosy. He wrinkled his snub nose at me cheerfully. I gave in. I don't sketch. I draw. Stylized pictures. Cartoons. Oh, great. I love that sort of stuff. Do you ever do comic strips? I love Calvin and Hobbes. And Asterix. I've got all these books. Look, look, I've even got Snowy on my snocks. On my socks. He hitched up his jeans and straightened his socks, which were all bunched up in his Woolies, Woolies trainers. Very cute, I said. He grinned. Okay, okay. I know my clothes aren't exactly hip. He was dead right there. If I was home, I'd be terrified of being talking to him, seen, being, seen, being seen talking to him. But he was kind of fun in a silly, lollopy way, as persistent as a puppy. He didn't even seem to mind my being so snappy with him. I wouldn't normally have been anywhere near as sharp. It was just I was getting seriously bothered about my stupid family. His family were all down in the grounds, peering knowledgeably at little heaps of stones. One of his sisters looked up and spotted us. Hey, Dan, come on down. We need your castle book. All the other little marigolds waved and shouted. I better get cracking. They won't stop now they've started, said Dan. You coming? I followed him down. Dad and Anna and Eggs weren't anywhere. Maybe I'd have to join up with the marigolds. I was getting so desperate that it began to seem an attractive idea.
but guess who I came across strolling round outside the castle walls? Dad and Anna and Eggs. They didn't look the slightest bit concerned. Hi, Ellie, said Dan. Hey, have you made a friend? Great. Dan grinned. I glared. Where have you been? I demanded. Well, we were showing Eggs the way medieval people went to the loo in the castle, and then he needed to go himself, so we had to trail right over to the toilets. Oh, poor Ellie. Were you getting worried? No, of course not, I said sulkily. See you around, Ellie, said Dan. I did see him around a few times after that, mostly with the marigolds and eggs. One day we joined up for a picnic. It even drizzled that day, so we ate damp sandwiches and soggy sausages and mushy crisps. No one else seemed to find this depressing. Dan was especially good at keeping all the little ones amused. Eggs adored him. I got sick of all this clowning around and went and sat on a wet rock and drew. I was doodling away when a shadow fell across my page. I snapped my book shut. Let me see, said Dan. No, meanie. Go on, special favour, seeing as it's the last day of the holes. Thank God. What? I can't stick this dump. You're mad, it's fantastic. And anyway, who wants to go back home, school on Monday? Yuck, yuck, yuck. I wonder what it'll be like in year nine. You're not going to be in year nine, I said. I'd found out that Dan was only twelve, not even a teenager yet. Yes, I am. Rubbish, you'll be in year eight with the other little boys. I am going to be in year nine, honest. Dan looked unusually embarrassed. I've been put up a year, right? Oh, God, because you're so brainy. You've got it. Trust you. I should have sussed you out for a right swat. You ought to be pleased you're going out with a boy of mega brain power, said Dan. We're not going out, idiot. I wish we could. What? I like you, Ellie, he said seriously. Will you be my girlfriend? No, of course not. You're just a baby. Don't you fancy having a toy boy? Definitely not. Can't I see you sometimes? You're nuts, Dan. You live in Manchester. I live in London, right? Can we write to each other then? He nagged on until I gave in and scribbled my address on a page torn from my sketchbook. He's probably lost it already, knowing Dan. Not that I want to know him. He won't bother writing even if he's still got the address. And even if he does, I don't think I'll reply. There's no point. I mean, he's just this irritating little kid. I suppose he's okay in small doses, but he's not exactly boyfriend material. Oh dear, if only he were five years older and not all nerdy and nutty. Why can't he be really cool with fantastic fair hair and dark brown eyes? I wonder if I'll see that blonde boy again tomorrow. I slow down, going all dreamy just thinking about him, and then I catch sight of my face in a shop window. I look like I'm brain dead, eyes glazed, mouth open, and then I see the clock at the top of the shop and it's gone nine. Gone nine? It can't be. It is. Gone nine, number nine, my first day in year nine. I'm going to be in trouble before I've even started. Two best friends. It's weird walking along the corridor to Mrs. Henderson's room. We would have to have Mrs. Hockey Sticks Henderson as our class tutor in year nine. What is it about games teachers? She's always picked on me right from year seven. Come along, Eleanor. Missed again, Eleanor. You're not even running, girl. Get a move on. I developed strategic tactics, suddenly stricken with appalling migraines or agonising periods at the start of every games lesson, but she soon got wise to me. She made me run six times around the hockey pitch for malingering and blew her poxy whistle at me whenever I tried to slow down. I can't stick, Mrs. Henderson. I've always hated P.E. Magda sometimes hangs about with me and acts like she's useless too. She doesn't like games either. She hates to get her hair blown about and she won't try to catch a ball in case she breaks her nail. Yet if she's forced to participate, she can run like the wind, shoot six goals in a row at netball, whack a hockey ball clear across the pitch. At least Nadine is even more hopeless than me. She looks graceful, but when she's forced to run, her arms and legs jerk out at odd angles, and she totters around like a broken puppet, her head hanging. I can't wait to see Magda and Nadine. Haven't seen them for weeks. We only got back from that stupid crumbling cottage yesterday, but somehow my feet are going more and more slowly as they squeak along the newly polished corridor. They look so hideous too. Regulation brown school shoes. You've never seen such rubbish. Rubbish. Your actual clerks clodhoppers. When any other, school, other school girls can wear whatever they want. Heels, trainers, Doc Martins. Oh, there are these seriously wonderful sexy shoes in Shelley's. Okay, they've got heels, high heels, but they're this amazing shiny bronze colour. Now bronze is brown. Well, brownish. I begged Anna to let me have them for school, but she wouldn't give in. It's so unfair. Just because she wears those boring, slony little pumps all the time, she's one inch taller than Dad and ever so self-conscious about it. Eleanor Allard. Oh, God, it's Miss Trumper, the deputy head. She's even worse than Mrs. Henderson. School's only started five minutes and she's already on the warpath. It's pathetic. Why can't these old bags get a life? What are you doing lurking in the corridor, Eleanor? 
Nothing, Miss Trumper. I can see that for myself. Whose class are you in this year? Mrs. Henderson's, I say, nodding at the door right in front of me. Well, why are you just standing there? You don't mean to tell me you've been sent out the classroom in disgrace already? No, haven't even gone in there yet. Well, do so, Eleanor, at once. I seize the door handle. I can hear Mrs. Henderson in full flow inside, giving the class an introduction to the thousand and one rules that must never be broken in Class 9 Neptune. Oh yeah, all the years are divided into these pathetic planets. Venus, Mars, Mercury and Neptune. Funny how they never pick Uranus. We're Neptune, and we have this little trident thing on our badges. It's all so boring. None of us want to be in Neptune anyway. Magda fancies Venus and Nadine wants to be in Mars because she likes the chocolate bars. And I want to be in Mercury because I've got a soft spot for the late, lamented Freddy. Eleanor, Miss Trumper, has paused halfway along the corridor. Have you gone into a catatonic trance? Dear goodness, they think they're so witty. No, Miss Trumper. Then go into your classroom. I take a deep breath and turn the handle. In I go, and there's Mrs Henderson, sitting on her table, swinging her legs. She's wearing a yucky, pleated skirt to show she's being, being class tutor but she's got bare legs and ankle socks and tennis shoes, so she's all set to bounce off down to the gym when she's finished giving everyone an earful first lesson. I get two earfuls. In fact, she gets so aerated that my poor ears expand to Dumbo proportions, stuff like first day and idleness and attitude and just not good enough. I bow my head and act like I'm in the depths of despair just to disconcert her. Under my hair, I peer round for Magda and Nadine. Great, they're right at the back. Magda's grinning at me, Nadine gives me a little wave. They've saved me the seat in between them. And eventually, Mrs. Henderson draws breath and lets me slide off to the back. Magda whispers, Hi, babe. And Nadine gives me some chewing gum and I settle down and school is started. At least old Henderson didn't give me a detention for being late the first day. First days are always so bitty. There's all the new timetables and notebooks and each and every teacher starts in on their own little lecture about now you're in year nine. Then at morning break, Chrissy shows us all these photos she took in Barbados during the holidays and then Jess has has us all in fits telling us about the action holiday she went on where she did this bungee jumping and she keeps trying to demonstrate so we don't have a moment's peace to be just us Magda Nadine and Ellie until after lunch we saunter off to our special place on the steps that lead down to the porter cabins it's where the three of us have always sat for the last two years but there's a whole bunch of drippy little new kids hanging around doing handstands up against the wall, skirts tucked into their brand new regulation, ghastly grey school knickers. Please, said Magda, can't you kiddiewinks go and wave your legs somewhere else? It's just too distracting, dearies. They straighten up, giggling foolishly, and then scatter when Magda flaps her hands at them. Right, she says, seating herself carefully. Her skirt is a good six centimetres shorter than mine. She has to position it with extreme accuracy, or else... She'll be the one showing off her knickers, which are definitely not regulation. Nadine sits beside her, kicking off her battered school shoes. I can see her black pearl toenail varnish through her tights. I nudge up beside them, feeling a sudden warm rush of love for both of them. Nadine's been my friend ever since nursery school, when we stirred bright green dough in the Wendy house and played, we were poisoning all the dollies. We stayed staunch friends all through primary school, playing witches in the playground and mermaids when we went swimming, and ghosts when we spent the night at each other's houses. We vowed we would stay best friends forever, and ever, just the two of us. But the first year of secondary school, we weren't allowed to sit where we wanted. We had to be in alphabetical order. I found myself sitting next to Magda. I was a bit scared of Magda at first. Even when she was only 11, she had a proper figure and she arranged her hair in a very sophisticated style and wore a thick coat of mascara so that her eyes looked knowing. She had finely plucked eyebrows that she raised when she took a second look at you. She hardly spoke to me the first week. Then one time in class, I was doodling on the back of my new school rough book, drawing an ultra hip cool hat Magda. I made her a real pussycat with sharp whiskers and a fluffy tail. I drew me as a little fat mouse, frightened of Magda, all twitchy nose and scrabbly paws. Magda suddenly leant over to me to see what I was doing. She worked it out at once. Hey, Ellie, that's great, she said. So I drew some more stuff, and she liked that too. We were friends after that. She wanted me, me to be her best friend. Only, of course, I had Nadine, and Nadine didn't like Magda at all at first. But when Magda invited me over to her place one day after school, I forced Nadine to come too. I wanted moral support more than anything else. I imagined Magda living this amazing, cool, independent, independent existence. I couldn't have been more wrong. She's got this lovely, noisy, interfering, funny family. Magda's the baby. Everyone's pet. 
She acts like a cute little kid at home. Anyway, she invited Nadine and me up to her bedroom. She gave us both a full makeup job. I loved it. She actually made me look like I had big dark eyes behind my specs. She did this subtle line each side of my face so it looked like I had cheekbones. It was the first time I'd ever worn makeup and I thought it was wonderful. Nadine was a bit sniffy. Magda said it was her turn. She gave Nadine a real gothic look, chalk white face and truly black lipstick and astonishing outlined eyes. When Nadine saw herself in the mirror, she smiled all over her amazing new face and wanted Magda to be her friend too. So we've been this best friend threesome ever since, right through year seven and eight. Now we're year nine, 13. Well, Magda's nearly 14 and Nadine is 14 in December, but I've got to wait all the way until June. It's irritating. I really look the youngest now because I'm still so small and roly-poly with these revolting chubby cheeks. I have dimples, for goodness sake. I'm used to Magda looking older, especially now she's highlighted her hair. But Nadine used to look really young for her age, with a heart-shaped face and her long black hair tumbling around her shoulders, like an Alice in negative. Now she looks different. Come on then, haven't seen you both for ages. What have you been up to, says Magda. But she doesn't pause for breath. She tells Nadine and me all about her Spanish holiday and how all these waiters kept waylaying her and this guy at the pool kept picking her up and throwing her in the water and this other much older guy kept trying to buy her drinks at the poolside. This is the standard Magda stuff and I don't always concentrate because I'm watching Nadine. She doesn't look as if she's listening either, bending forward so that her hair hides her face like a black velvet curtain. She's inking a tattoo on her wrist with a black felt tip pen. A careful heart with an elaborate inked frill. This is a change for Nadine. Her tattoos are usually skulls or spiders. What about you, Nadine? I say the second Magda shuts up. What about me, says Nadine. You mean my holes? I saw you after, before you went to the cottage. It was hell, relentlessly cheery, and you had to queue for hours and all the kids had Mickey Mouse ears, and there were all these giant cartoon characters waving at everyone. It was all so bright, it made my eyes ache. Crawl back to your coffin, Miss Vampire, says Magda, laughing. I bet Natasha loved it. Natasha is Nadine's little sister. Nadine and I have never been able to stand her, but Magda is extraordinary. She actually likes little kids. She's even fond of eggs. She always goes on about how she'd like to have little brothers and sisters herself. Natasha ate four ice creams and then was very sick all down her brand new pink Minnie Mouse t-shirt, says Nadine. She painstakingly inks a name across her heart. I lean forward to read it. Liam, I say. Nadine blushes. Nadine never blushes. She doesn't look as if she's got enough blood, but now I can see bright pink beneath the fronds of black hair. Liam, says Magda. I didn't know you were on an Oasis fan. Not that, Liam, says Nadine. Magda looks at me for enlightenment. I shake my head. We both turn back to Nadine. So, who's this Liam then? Magda asks. Oh, says Nadine. A tiny pause. He's my boyfriend. We stare at her. Your boyfriend? I nearly tip over backwards down the steps. Nadine has a boyfriend. I can't believe it. How come Nadine's got a boyfriend before me? Before Magda? Magda has loads of guys fawning all over her. Well, so she says, but she doesn't actually go out with anyone yet. A real boyfriend, says Magda, and she sounds just as shocked as me. But you don't even like boys, Nadine, I say. I like Liam, says Nadine, and he isn't even a boy anyway. Not really. He's 17, at college. So where did you meet him, says Magda, sounding suspicious. How come you've never even mentioned him before? Yes, you didn't say a thing about this Liam in your letters, Nad, I say. I wrote a lot of letters to Nadine and Magda when I was cooped up in the cottage. Magda never bothers to write back properly. She just sends postcards with love and kisses Magda on the back, which is sweet, but not exactly informative. Nadine is a much more satisfactory correspondent. Several pages in her carefully printed italic script with little showers of star and moon sequins scattered inside the envelope. But all she wrote about was this weird new band she's been keen, been keen on and how she's trying to teach herself to read the tarot and a whole long moan about her family. Her dad's forever honoured her to work harder, even though she's always in the top three at school. He can't see why she can't come top in everything, which is crazy because Anna, Amna is always way in front of everyone and she's got this mega IQ, like she's a total genius and no one could ever beat her no matter how hard they tried. Then her mum hates Nadine's clothes and makeup and hairstyle and wants her to smarten up, wear these chichi clothes and smile like an American cheerleader. 
and Natasha is just awfulness in ankle socks, acting the angel child whenever mummy and daddy are around, but being the brat from hell whenever Nadine is forced to look after her. So, there was all the usual stuff, but not a single line about Liam. I can't help feeling outraged. Nadine and I always tell each other everything. Why didn't you tell me, I say. My voice cracks, almost as if I'm going to start crying. I've only just met him, says Nadine, stretching her arm out to admire her completely completed love token tattoo. Ah, says Magda, her eyebrows arching. So, he's just this guy you've seen around, right? Not an actual boyfriend. An I wish boyfriend, I say, cheering up considerably, getting all set to tell them about this blonde guy I saw coming to school this morning. No, no, Liam and I went out together Saturday night, says Nadine. We met in Tower Records that morning. I was sorting through the indie section and he was too. And uh, we were both looking for the same band and there was just the one CD, so he said I could have it. And then he asked you out, just like that, I say incredulously. Well, we chatted a bit. He did. I couldn't think of anything to say, actually. I was just standing there dying, wishing I could come out with something, anything. And then he started asking me about this other group who had a gig at the Wiley Fox that night. And he said, did I want to go? So I said, yes. Though I've never been to the Wiley Fox. Well, any pub. You know, my mum and dad, they'd go crazy if they ever found out. So when I got back, I said, you'd got back from the cottage early, Ellie. And we were both going round to Magda's for this little party. And then your dad was going to take me home. I had to say that because I guessed I'd be back really late from the Wiley Fox. Hope you don't mind. So you went there on your own, I say astonished. I still can't believe it. Nadine's always so quiet. She generally stays shut up in her bedroom playing her loopy music night after night. She never goes anywhere. And he turned up okay, this Liam, says Magda. I didn't think he would. I was so scared of going in there by myself. I was sure they'd chuck me out for being underage, says Nadine. Why didn't you phone me? I'd have come with you, says Magda. Yes, but it might have put him off. Or he might have liked you better than me, says Nadine. Magda nods. No, I thought I'd just put my head around the door and have a look, and then I could always run home if I wanted. But he was there before me. He paid for us to get into the back room where the band were playing, and then he took me home after. Well, to the end of the road. I don't dare let him come further in case my mum and dad saw. And then I'm seeing him again next Saturday, so I can say I'm spending it with you, Ellie. Yeah, sure, I say, still stunned. So what's he like, says Magda. Oh, he's really cool. Dark hair, moody, dark eyes, hip clothes. Did you tell him how old you are? I ask. Not at first. I made out I was 15. And he said, nearly old enough, says Nadine, giggling. Oh God, says Magda. Yeah, okay, but later I was talking about you two. And I said I'd been friends with Ellie forever and friends with Magda the two years we'd been in secondary school. And then I realised what I'd said. And Liam twigged. But he just teased me a bit. He doesn't mind that I'm only 13. Well, nearly 14. He says I act old for my age, actually. I see, says Magda. So, did you snog? Yes, lots. Did he open his mouth? Of course, says Nadine. He's a truly great kisser. My own mouth is open. Nadine and I have frequently discussed French kissing, and we both thought it a squirmily revolting idea. Someone else's sluggy tongue slivering around your fillings. You said, I started. Nadine giggles. Yes, but it's different with Liam. It's great, isn't it, says Magda, who has given us frequent accounts of her own amorous encounters. Nadine is looking at me almost pityingly. You'll see, Ellie, she says, when you get a proper boyfriend of your own. That's it. My mouth stays open and starts talking. Oh, don't worry, I've got a boyfriend, I say, before I can stop myself. Nadine stares at me. Magda stares at me. It's like I've nipped out around my glasses and I'm staring at me too. What have I just said? What am I doing? How come I started this? But I can't stop now. And that's where we'll leave part one of Girls in Love by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with much more on my channel. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye bye.